It's currently whatever time you're listening to podcasts, and we have a caller on the line. Caller, you're on the air with Have You Seen This? Hi, my name is uh, Percy Jones, and I'm from St. Louis. And I was just calling because I hear you talk about movies on this podcast. I would be interested in you reviewing a 1988 film adaptation of a play, preferably one by Eric Bogosian, <laughs> that is based possibly on the murder of talk radio host Ellen Berg. Do you have anything that fits that description? You bet, caller, and we will discuss talk radio right after this. Welcome to Have You Seen This? The world's only podcast about obscure, overlooked, and misbegotten media. All discussions will be spoiler heavy. You have been warned. Wow, you guys, we just did a play. That was awesome. Yeah. Um, so my <laughs> name is not whatever stupid fucking name I just gave earlier, and that isn't even what I sound like, so that's the real M. Night Shyamalan twist of this whole situation. You I already mean forgot you don't it. actually call into radio shows and talk like this and make well, I, real I, wet noises into the mic? I call into radio shows, but I don't use that voice. I actually use a high-pitched voice. <laughs> <laughs> Throws the scent off. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, that's a, so that's one thing which we don't have anymore, or at least in, um, you know, it's kind of a dead format, is uh, talk radio. Uh, the other thing very prominent in this movie, which uh, is deprecated, is uh, cigarettes. Right, yeah, you don't have to go through an intermediary. You can just say shit directly to people online. You don't have That's to ta- talk through a phone. You don't have to have like one source. You can just, you know, you see a, you know, a blue check on Twitter and you can tell them to fuck off directly to their, uh, you know, unread uh, messages. Oh, it depends on whether or not they've allowed the uh, response thing. Because <laughs> uh. now, now famous people can just block messages from people they don't know. Very annoying. I'm not, I'm not a fan of that. Boo, enjoy your ivory tower. Um, it, was, it was interesting how much the protagonist of this movie was willing to engage with the lunatics calling into his show yeah yeah i mean it's it should i should i like like maybe introduce myself or talk about like what my background is with this thing because i actually have a little bit of a story with talk radio and why it's something that's interesting to me yeah you pushed for this and jen and i were were both on board but yeah let's let's hear your story Sweet. So my actual name is Josh, uh, Josh Borman. I'm a co-host of The Worst of All Possible Worlds. Uh, the real heads, the real have you seen this heads, might remember uh, the episode <laughs> that Brian and I came on was like like a month and a half ago or something like that, where we talked about that horrible Golem movie, It. It was delightful. I, I yeah. was more like, what? <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I... Um, the reason that I was interested in this, and I think Jen had you was it Jen you had mentioned on on Twitter like talk radio. I, I don't remember how this came about exactly. I feel like um, well, it was we you were, were talking. You're, yeah, you're kind uh, of maybe Tim remembers better than I do. <laughs> I think you were canvassing for no maybe eighties movies, but I think yeah, Josh jumped in when it was like uh, I want to talk about talk radio anytime anywhere give me this opportunity and at that point you're just like yeah okay hell yeah um right because it actually it fits into the show mission statement very well because um you know in in spite of this being a movie with some heavy names associated with it uh eric bogosian oliver stone uh alec baldwin um it does not appear that it made very much money in its initial run but um josh you talked about having a connection to this or special interest in this so please uh, finish what you were going to say about it yeah well my experience with this is actually not with the movie I had never seen the movie um, before I watched it for this Um, my experience was with the play because when I was in college um, and studying theater and thinking that I was you going to be You were a theater kid? This conversation is over. <laughs> I know. It's shocking, right? Don't worry, though. <laughs> I was a play guy, not a musical guy. Um, Ooh, <laughs> so Christ. hopefully that redeems me. No, let's, um, let's Tim will still speak Julie to you in that case. Yeah, let's talk about <laughs> Strindberg. Strindberg. Yes. Hell yes. Um, 
But uh, I actually was in an acting class where we had to like pick a monologue from a contemporary play. And um, being, you know, an edgy, I don't know, fucking 19 year old or whatever. Um, of course, I wanted to be like, I'm going to find something super cool and super masculine and super like telling it what, like it is. And so I just read like all of Eric Bogosian's plays, like every single one of them. And what I had forgotten, actually, was that the monologue at the very end of this movie was the one that I performed in that class. I just rem- I just had remembered that talk radio was among the plays that I had read going into this class, but then that monologue that's at the end was the one that I was like, ooh, I can do this. This is going to be awesome. And I'm sure it was fucking terrible. Um, but yeah, that's basically, that. that's my, uh, that, that's my story. <laughs> well, you were learning. Yeah. Like this was an acting class. So this right. was your opportunity to have your professor and your fellow students tear you apart. Well, right. And what I learned is that I can't act. Um, but <laughs> Better later to learn on, that early, yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That's why I took up directing, which is a very lucrative fucking career. Um, but then uh, later on, actually, I ended up reading for a playwriting award. Uh, and Eric Bogosian was one of the people who was like one of the like selectors on the main panel or whatever. So it all kind of came full circle. Nice. Well, and uh, I should also say that since this is uh, based on an Eric Bogosian play, um, this entire episode is sponsored by the city of Glendale, Armenian pride. That's right. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Largest population of Armenians outside of Armenia. And isn't that that something? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. But um, Tim, do you were you familiar with Bogosian at all? I was only, I think, passingly familiar. I, I mean, I know him. Acting roles. Yeah, I know him as a, I think, a villain in a couple of movies. But I don't know where Josh gets off. I saw this movie on Betamax when I was a kid. Like, oh hell yeah, dude! Yeah, he yeah, too. Johnny Come Lately's here. I was watching this as a child. <laughs> And I bet you got a lot out of it, too. Well, yeah, I mean, I got the gist of it. So, you know, good on Oliver Stone for making a movie for kids. Yeah, it's, it's super age-appropriate. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is real life, all right? Yeah, Ooh, And man. the only way to encounter real life is to go out and to provoke people as much as possible, sometimes to homicidal rages. That's right, Jen. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and then someone will, will then blame you for it. Can you believe that? <sighs> Sad, really. Right. But, um... It's interesting watching this in the age of social media when kind mm-hmm. of the floodgates have been opened in terms of uh, public discourse and, uh, you know, the the access to the megaphone. And, you know, I can see how at the time with the rise of talk radio and shock jocks and such that, you know, this must have been very unnerving to people because, you know, people are going in the airwaves and just saying whatever crazy shit that may or may not get the the station fined. Um, I do I do have to shout out uh, Street Fight, uh, Brian, for uh, doing uh, Shocktober, which gave me a little bit of more of a cultural perspective on shock jocks, um, because that's a... That's an, a form which is, like I said earlier, is almost like entirely yeah. I mean, it's, just, it's like just Howard Stern at this point, pretty much, right? Like, yeah, who's even like, left. Yeah, and like how many people are listening to to satellite radio? But you know, I mean, the people get... who are listening and are largely listening to it because Howard Stern is on there. It's like one of exactly. those things where they signed him on, and he's one of the main just draws tenfold. for the platform. Yeah, and um, there is a little bit of Stern in uh, the Bogosian character, Barry Champlain. Yeah, especially in those flashback shots. <laughs> oh, yes. The hair, yeah. Has, yeah, the hair is incredible. Well, and, this would have uh, predated Stern, right? 1988? I yeah. don't know. He was His career was chugging along. Okay, because, I mean, I only, he, I only became aware of him when I was in high school, as I think most people do. Uh, right. Well, that, I think that was when he kind of became the nationwide phen- phenomenon that he yeah. became. But interesting tidbit, and here's where Tim rolls his eyes. So I was reading about uh, Air Florida Flight 90, uh-huh. <laughs> um, <laughs> which was a plane which uh, crashed into the Potomac River with only four or five survivors. Yeah. And when that happened, a certain uh, radio DJ called the Air Florida ticket counter um, to ask if he could get a ticket to for Flight 90. 
and that young man was Howard Stern. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, and and I'm, that was in 1980, so that's you know he was already doing this shit at the time. Right. Yeah, and I mean I I tell a lie too because apparently uh, Howard Stern uh, gained popularity when he was nationally broadcast uh, starting in 1986. Right. So, and I'm 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 reading about that too. Yeah, yeah. Like he sort of had sort of a similar rise, honestly, to the. Eric Bogosian character in this play where like he was a regional guy and then he got a national deal with WNBC and then he just fucking blew up yeah and so and the difficulty there as I think with a lot of uh, fables about fame is that are you able to sustain that or do you just sort of like flame out is it too much for you and then you know you just kind of blow up on the on the launch pad and you know Stern you know say what you will about him like he, his career has persisted for what 30 odd years now yeah uh, uh i was actually mistaken um he called howard stern called the air florida ticket counter to ask about buying tickets to the 14th street bridge that was where that uh plane crashed see that makes more oh. sense yeah that works as a joke oh i see he I asked mean, if it would be a regular stop <laughs> right yeah it's like the gilbert that godfrey so funny. joke about the uh Having to take a flight that stops off at the Empire State Building. (laughs) And I have to say, again, based on um, listening to Shocktober episodes uh, from from, uh, Brian of Street Fight, um, you don't realize, like, how utterly inane a lot of the radio content was uh, during the time of Shock Jocks. Yeah, that's why I don't even listen to podcasts. Yeah, it's jokes jokes that don't make any sense. It's bits that go nowhere. It's just you know. fill in time. Well, and, yeah. and I, I think talk yep. radio plays with this a little bit too, right? And and it's interesting because I don't I don't want to talk too much about the play because you know most of this is about the movie. But mm. I will say that I think that the play is actually a lot better than the movie. I think that most of the changes they made for the movie made it actively worse. And so really? when we do get to those different points, I would like to talk a little bit about what those changes were because. I, I, again, I think they make a, a uniformly less interesting movie, but um, there's a lot of scenes, and again, it's a bit more in the play, like it, it gives you more time to sit in those conversations longer, but that starts to feel weird in a movie context. They felt like they had to move it along, move it along, move it along. Um, mm-hmm. But there is more time given over to just really like mundane, like somebody's just calling to tell you about their day like that kind of shit um and there's a little bit of that in the movie as well but it focuses much more i think on the sort of spectacular shock jockey side of things right yeah and i wonder if that um maybe has a lot to do with um because oliver stone adapted this with bogosian right um and oliver stone was noted to uh has been noted to critique the media now and again um so i've heard so I wonder if maybe that was kind of more the Oliver Stone approach coming in where it's like, you know, look at this reprehensible cesspool of crap that is talk radio. Yeah, it's like, look at the medium, man. Because I think the, the play is a lot more about, like, this fucking guy and how sort of as a person, because he feels very little self, very little sense of like internal self-fulfillment he instead Mm -hmm. needs his audience to give him a sense of meaning and that also means that the monologue at the end makes a lot more sense in the context of the play than it does in the movie right yeah it isn't as uh well supported in the movie as i think it might have been in the in the play not that it isn't a great monologue it's a great fucking monologue yeah but it does um you should have heard my version of it when i was 19 years old the definitive (laughs) version (laughs) absolutely lost in the mists of time like tears and rain. Hey. <laughs> well, uh, where do we want to start uh, with digging into to talk radio? Uh, well, I, Jen, uh, a media person um, being assassinated. I'm sure you want to discuss Alan Berg. Yeah, um, Berg was interesting because um, he was of a type that I, I think that uh, there weren't. A, a whole hell of a lot of which was kind of like the liberal shock jock um yeah i mean outside because, of air america which i don't think is even around anymore al franken's distinguished career right yeah right and um well this is and this isn't gonna i don't think this will come as a surprise to most of our audience um knowing kind of 
the political bent of our show, but like even your average liberal has like fairly strong reactionary tendencies, which I think was, that was definitely true of Berg. Um, you know, the, the prototypical example being, uh, Tom Lakis, somebody who I think, uh, also influenced, uh, this play and this movie because, uh, Lakis has, you know, v liberal political opinions, apart from the fact that he just loathes women with every fiber of his being. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it seems to me that, um, you know, kind of the shock jock milieu is usually a fundamentally reactionary one in spite of its like surface, um, you know, provocative qualities. Um, but, uh, I actually don't know that much about, you know, what opinions Berg actually held because, you know, he was murdered in 1984. Um, and there isn't a lot of his material that's like still out there. There's maybe like a couple of clips on YouTube because, you know, nobody like who is recording the radio. Like a lot of the stuff is just, you know, it's off in the ether. Um, I mean, I'm but, sure there's somebody out there with tapes in the basement that are going to get found eventually. You know what I mean? But yeah, you're yeah. right. Like it's not it's not as if it's archived. Yeah, exactly. So it's you know it's 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 ephemeral. Like it's it's hard to go back and and look at it and see actually what Berg said. But what I do know about him is that you know he was a Jewish man with generally liberal opinions and thus he was a lightning rod for the hatred of uh many americans let's say um including white supremacists like very overtly anti-semitic people um a few of whom planned and executed his murder um he was gunned down in his driveway i think um very similar to what happens to barry champlain in the movie, basically, as he was getting in his car, um, in the case of Alan Berg, he, um, you know, these Nazi fucks came along with like a, a illegally modified semi-automatic weapon and, you know, filled him full of holes. And uh, that was it for. Yeah, so let uh, that be a Alan lesson Berg. to uh, you know any leftist who speaks up. I guess is the point. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, that's exactly why they do it because. Yeah. Uh, and I think that there are some, like, explicit nods to that in the movie with a lot of the things that the callers say to Barry. Yeah. I also, I also think, though, that the character of Barry isn't necessarily, like, liberal. He's more just, like, no. a devout contrarian. Whatever yes. it is that somebody comes on the air and says, he will immediately take the opposite opinion just to fuck with them. And so for him, like the not the, for one thing, there's actually there's fewer Nazis in the play. <laughs> there's, <laughs> there, the, or the Nazi has fewer calls. He's this the whole thing with like the fucking package and everything still happens, but it's less central to the play. Like the Nazi is one of many callers, um, but like when that Nazi calls in, both in the movie and in the play, he's just kind of like, he tells this whole story about how, you know, he went to um, a concentration camp and how, you know, it moved him so deeply and how he still has a little Star of David that he found. But, you know, we pan down to his hands and he's just fucking holding his mug. Like, he, he's making it up. And we, yeah, we right. can't really tell how sincere he is. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, all kind this, of an act. Um, yeah, and I... I realized near the end of this movie, as I was watching it, that this is the play and the movie are really the the cri de coeur of the professional troll. Um, <laughs> I guess we should have had Mike on for this. <laughs> Still trolling. Well, Mike um, Hale. No, uh, friend of, friend of the show, uh, Bitter Corilla on Twitter. Okay. I know you're listening, Mike. But um, yeah, like uh. The, the, like the word that you mentioned Josh like contrarian like I think that's really key um, could, because the other thing that occurred to me as I was thinking over this movie like after I watched it was um, I was thinking about uh, people who are people who are avoidant versus people who actually face life and all its um, negativity people and who I was face thinking it or about people who seek it out but go ahead. Well, the people who um, 
because I think a lot of people are, are avoidant in, in different ways. And on the surface, Barry doesn't seem like an avoidant character because he's very confrontational. But um, the yeah. way, like, or conflict if you averse, look at, I think most people are. Sure. But if you look at the, um, you know, for example, the conversation between him and his ex-wife, where it's like there's actually like an extremely intimate moment between them on the air. And then he immediately, you know, not to evoke Tom Lakus again, but, mm -hmm. you know, he immediately makes a hard right turn into misogyny, basically. It occurs to me, like, isn't being abrasive and confrontational like its own form of being avoidant? Because a lot of that, it, a lot of what happens to Barry in the movie is like as a result of him like kind of avoiding like his raw real yeah, like, feelings. Like the best uh, defense is a good offense. Right. So, you know, as such, it's like a really, um, and I would be curious to read the play as well, but you know, as it is like as a portrait of like a certain kind of guy, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's really fascinating. Um, the one big difference between, I guess, hey, I'm just going to fucking talk about the play a bunch because I love this play and Do I it. did not love this movie, which is why I think it's going to be kind of interesting to talk about the differences. Um, the, uh, the scene with, uh, his wife in the movie is, is pretty long. And this is the scene where, you know, he basically, uh, ends up backhanding her verbally and, you know, telling her that he doesn't love her anymore and all that kind of stuff. Um, that wife character does not exist in the play at all. Hmm. Uh, there's just the gal he's fucking and his producer. His producer. And they're not they're not actually fucking anymore. They just were for a bit. Mm -hmm. And the function of that scene in the play is for him to uh, be like she basically asks the same question and then he's like, Yeah, like no, like you you should probably just fucking like that guy's a piece of shit. So you probably shouldn't be going after him anymore, which is completely the inverse of what happens in the movie where he's very aggro. But I think either way, it does point to that thing of, you know, he is a conflict avoidant person who is only able to engage in any form of confrontation if he's performing a persona. Interesting. I can see I, that, yeah. Well, and, and you know, that um, leads to the question of why the kind of, uh, you know, the bifurcation of the one uh, female character right. in play into two. I mean, I think it's because they thought it needed more plot. So they added that whole fucking scene where, like, his wife comes over and he's in the middle of an orgy or whatever. And, and I, I was like, this is just, like, really... This doesn't really give us anything from a character perspective, and it's also not good storytelling, just visually or script-wise. This is this, it felt very pat and cliche to me. Well, they do um, they do end up describing like the whole arc of their relationship in like in that section. Mm -hmm. I guess that was I guess that was the the motivation for that. You know, how did they? You know, because when they 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 get they meet up again like near the beginning of the movie and there's obviously interestingly there's still like a, a strong attraction right but then we look back at you know what their marriage was like we get this little like capsule vision of what it was um even the costuming alone on the wife is very conservative very um i don't know trad i guess you'd say i would say bizarrely so that was the thing that really took me out of it. I was like what the fuck is this lady wearing <laughs> 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 it's the eighties. Uh, you're gonna get that. I don't know. I don't know. I I um like I I definitely see it. Um, I mean, it seems to fit the character in that it's a uh, you know, like maybe like a clumsy representation of someone who's very buttoned up versus yeah. someone who's not. Yeah, that's my um, takeaway from it. I guess I'm still turning it over in my mind as to whether or not it was effective. It sounds like it, um. Josh didn't care for it. I didn't have a problem with it, but I haven't read the play. So I don't know. Yeah. What did you think, Tim? Well, it, it, I think it, it got the point across, um, but I haven't read the play. So I don't know. Right. Well, shit, we need to read the play. Yeah, not right. to make we'll this be, too we'll much right about back, the play, folks. but one other thing about the play. <laughs> I hear the play is um, the thing. <laughs> yeah, that gets the conscience of the king. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the um, it, All of the scenes that in the movie are done with dialogue are also done as monologue in the play. 
there will be a device where somebody will like step down stage from the action and then there's like a spot on them and they'll have their like two three minute monologue talking about how they met Barry and what their relationship with him is that's another thing that works on stage that probably wouldn't work in a movie although I then did have the thought of what if they had staged this as a mockumentary which actually (laughs) kind of could have been interesting but then I don't know anyway you can't do that in a movie unless you do the mockumentary format. So I understand why they made the changes that they did. Right. Yeah. And even the monologues too, I feel like the monologues in this, like they fit in a play, but you don't see that in movies so much. I think it's Mm -hmm. maybe too direct uh, because they are like, Oh yeah, this sounds like a character in a play. It's like, let me lay out all the things that I'm thinking right now, Mm -hmm. express them to you. Well, that's an interesting approach too, because like, um, I mean, I did know that this was based on a play going into it. So, of course, like I'm sitting there waiting for the seams to show, if you will, for Mm -hmm. it to be um, stagey or talky or anything. Um, We, in fact, just watched a an adaptation of a play, uh, Miguel Pinero's Short Eyes, which was the last episode um, and which made a reasonably good use of the, the space within the setting without being overly talky um you know pedophile monologues aside um but i was surprised at how kinetic this movie actually managed to be while still while coming from a stage play yeah it does kind of work like a pressure cooker a lot of the time i mean the 15 first 15 minutes of the movie are all within the studio there are you know people talking over each other there's a pressure for time uh and i don't think it happens in this scene but later on um uh, you know, Stone is, you know, spinning the camera around, uh, around like the, you know, the main console. So whenever, uh, what's the name? Barry, whenever he has like his monologues or he's doing his show, like the, the scene is constantly in motion and it's, it is, you know, kind of like you're in a whirlwind, just the, the camera making this circular movement. So it does keep the tension up and it does keep, um, uh, it, it does remain, you know, really active. It isn't like... Yeah. Yeah. And those are, those camera movements um, earlier in the film are very much, like, grounded in the real world because they... they It's, you know, it's someone... Mo- you're moving around the desk, like, on a track or something like that. And then for the monologue at the end of the film, though, it, it kind of takes you out of reality a little bit because, you know, they I, I have no idea how they set it up, but it's obvious that... They probably put it on a turntable. Yeah, like Bogosian was yeah. put on something which was turning and, you know, the camera is moving with him as like the whole setup turns, which, you know, when you see it, it's like, oh, like we're in like a different space from where we are, where we were earlier. Yeah, sort of inadvertently addressing all the people in the background um, and just like, as, you know, as, as his audience. And there are other interesting bits of camera work, too. The uh, split diopter you know, because they're showing yes. Barry in like the extreme foreground, taking up like a full half the screen, and then you have other minor characters in the back, which you know clearly illustrates the you know significance and the uh, uh, the scale of each of these characters uh, in the story. Yeah, and a lot of a lot of layering using the glass of the studio, like um, people behind glass or people reflected in glass, like these multiple layers of people listening or or lurking or right you know which unfortunately you aren't gonna see in a play did, well i'm curious like did those um techniques and those angles and those shots work for you because for me i just felt frustrated by them i felt like it was trying to translate something from the stage into a more cinematic thing but because of the fact that So much of the play and and, and what makes the play interesting being a play that is set entirely in the studio. They don't leave the studio at all in the play. The whole Mm -hmm. thing happens there. Yeah. Is that you develop a sense of claustrophobia yourself just from watching what's happening on stage. You start to feel like you are inside his mind because, you know, the line sort of blurs between theatrically what is going on in that world on stage and what you are experiencing watching it. And I felt like the direction this tried to do that, but I ultimately felt more distant from it as a result. And I'm, I'm, I'm curious to hear what you what you think about that. I think well, that it does that in the opening scene. Like, it does it capture that same claustrophobia that you're talking about. I yeah. think the problem is that unless you're trying to get, like, really, um, I don't know, want to say, like, experimental, 
to do that for the entire duration of a film is going to be pretty tricky. Yeah. So I, I think like the first scene of that, like the first 15 minutes of it is sort of expressing that same feeling that you would have had in the play before being like, well, we got to get out of this room. We can't spend two hours just in one location. Right. Yeah. Cause a couple of things about that, like number one, like because the, the, that opening, you know, 15 minutes or whatever is such a, like, um, it's like a whole section unto itself. I was wondering if the movie was going to break down into different sections, but um, it was a little freer than that. The other thing that comes to mind is that I guess it it probably would have been possible to confine the entire thing to the studio. Um, yeah, uh, well, and, and because we... like you know we like I said you know having just um, watched and reviewed Short Eyes like that is a movie which takes place entirely within the tombs. Sure, um, and you don't go anywhere beyond the um the day room um the corridor between the cells and then the cells themselves and it works reasonably well uh, it does give you that feeling of of intense claustrophobia um even that's I, I like know. four locations maybe, though maybe the best way i can put it because i'm not i'm not convinced that like keeping the whole thing in the studio is the solution Mm -hmm. I, I just wasn't convinced that this solution was the right solution either. One one thing that I was thinking is like, to what extent is this? And again, it seems like my opinions on this were just a little bit different from from how you received it. But um, to me, it sort of felt like a bit of a mismatch between um, the material and the director. Like, I would love to see what like a Mike Nichols version of this movie would look like, if that makes sense. Mm hmm. Just because that's somebody who has a lot of stage experience and also understands here are the techniques that work really well on stage and here are the special things you can do with the camera. Here's where the two sort of overlap, but then beyond that, never the twain shall meet because you're working with two completely different tool sets. You know what I mean? Right. And um, it's possible that uh, I'm slightly out of my... Um knowledge zone because I'm not extraordinarily versed in theater. Um Tim, you uh you know theater people. How about you? Oh, oh do I ever. Uh, <laughs> Don't no, say I'm... it like that. Come <laughs> on. No, I mean I understand that yeah, there are two kind of different styles and you know different languages and different tools that you have to work with depending on how you're telling your story, which is why uh the sort of stagey parts like you know monologues in particular why those stand out in a movie just because movie just plays by slightly different rules mm -hmm. and i'm i'm not saying that you know it's it's good or bad but it is uh noticeable when things there is a different i don't know rhythm to it there that letting one character speak for a prolonged period of time just seems uh, something that you don't see in movies too often, but it does fit plays, and I understand that there are a lot of um, cues in the way that the that the play is written that are copied over to film, kind of in their in their initial uh, format. Well, and maybe sense. maybe another example that I would use of like something else, another another thing where the source material involves pretty long monologues, mm -hmm. where it was able to be translated pretty well to the screen and I fucking hate to hand it to Ryan Murphy I really truly do but <laughs> the uh, I, I hate that you're handing it to I, Ryan Murphy so do I but the <laughs> uh, the HBO adaptation of the normal heart is really good when did that come out was it like late 90s or no no this was pretty remember? recent this was just a few years ago um, oh I'll be damned because that's a, that's actually a play from much earlier mm -hmm. in the AIDS epidemic, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, it, it was still like, at the point that it was originally performed, you know, they had the big memorable thing from uh, the original production was that they would have like a projection of how many people had died of AIDS and they would update it every single night so that when you walked out, you would see what that number was. Ooh, that's, uh, that's potent. Yeah. And especially in light of... Uh, monkeypox because like i'm already seeing people blame the queers of course for yeah. the spread of monkeypox because uh queer sex is just fundamentally different from straight sex of yeah course. no straight people never ever like do it up do the anal. butt or right. anything yeah, i no. probably <laughs> wouldn't have sex with a monkey <laughs> probably <laughs> that's how you get monkeypox right what about like a really was... hot monkey 
Yeah, like, like what if it was Helena Bonham Carter from uh, the Planet of the Apes remake? Ooh. Okay, yeah, you kind of got me in a bind here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you would smash Tim. Yeah, never say never. Uh, so, I yeah. think you would become a vector. I think you would become uh, the Gaten Dugas of monkeypox. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it happens. Just take Sorry, apologies to the Dugas family. He was not actually patient zero. <laughs> um, but just, uh, just to pull it back to the point about um, the, the Normal Heart movie, mm. um, what makes that work so well is that as annoying as Ryan Murphy is, and again, like I said, <laughs> I fucking hate to hand it to him. Um, he does such a good job in that movie of letting the camera just rest when it needs to rest and then making it live and active and exciting when it needs to be live and active and exciting. And sometimes he goes too over the top in the latter sense, because again, he's Ryan Murphy, but, um, the moments that need to sit and need to land do. And I felt Mm -hmm. like sometimes that wasn't the case in this movie, if that makes sense. I gotcha. And maybe I'm not picking up on it, not having looked at the play on the page. And again, like not having a, you know, really expansive grasp of theater in spite of being really into reading plays when I was a nerdy high schooler. Uh, I'll send you the ebook reason. later. I would love to read it, actually. So they're um, saying that like I, the stone does, isn't a good mesh for the material. I don't know. It seems, um, but based on my... Um, Based on what I've seen of Oliver Stone, it seems... I mean, I can certainly see why he did it. Um, you know, he does love his uh, media critique, and it is it is very political. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, that kind of brings me to a question that I had at the end of the movie, is, like, what exactly is... Um, what are the politics of yeah, this Yeah, what's movie? the critique? Right. Um, and, and that's something, too, that I'm not sure that this is actually supposed to be a critique of the shock jock format. I think that it's Eric Bogosian being a certain age and wanting to write a play about a lonely misanthrope and then finding a framing to place it in. I'm not sure that it's about something much bigger than this fucking guy in his neuroses. Feel free to disagree yeah, with I me, think, though. Okay. Well, you may be onto something because, um, you know, the the shock jock is certainly like one of the most extreme types of guy that you can be um and there are still a lot of yeah i'm still working at it i'm trying trying to get our numbers up jen (laughs) (laughs) um well uh listen to our short eyes episode if you were if you were looking to be offended right as uh um, man, I actually had to cut stuff out of that episode, but, um, do you want me to get jokes. like really out of pocket and say some stuff about Italians or something like that? <laughs> What's out hey, of pocket about that? Yeah, I don't care what you say about WAPs. <laughs> I got WAP friends. It's okay. Yeah, hell yeah. I'm watching the Sopranos right now. I understand the Italians really well. Yeah. It's like, you have no idea. <laughs> really empathize. Um, I really empathize with the Dago struggle. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, who doesn't? Um, the you know they're really the last group that you're allowed to be uh, bigot, openly bigoted towards. Well, so. them and the Irish. Yeah, um, pour on out for them and the bog apes. <laughs> but um, no, like you know, going back to it being about uh, less about the media and more about a guy. Um, it really is like, I mean, so much of this movie. Um, will have you cringing in recognition if you are a woman who has dated very intelligent guys. Um, You may not have dated a type of guy exactly like Barry Champlain, but the... You've dated some um, cool fucking guys. I've dated some (laughs) cool fucking guys in my time. Um, That's why I'm leaning into the other half of my uh, bisexuality these days. But, um, no, like... Just in the way that he, in the way that he treats women, in the way that you see his relationship with his producer, where it's like, I mean, how many of us have been in a relationship where it's like, yeah, you know, I mean, it's, it's good when he's not kind of treating me like shit or like an afterthought, like that kind of a thing. Um, and I wonder Girl, if you maybe need that to leave him. <laughs> <laughs> You see the relationship with his uh, Laura, his producer, like kind of going in the same direction as the relationship with his ex-wife. Um, you know, just the moment where he 
comforts her when he's going to see his ex-wife and he leaves, you know, he's cuddling her, he kisses her on the, on the, on the forehead. And he's like, you know, if you could clean up a little before you leave. Yeah, that was, that was, I, I actually, that, that is something that was not in the play. And I thought that was pretty, like, that was well, well uh, put together. Well, well. A good character moment. Good character moment. That's what I'm looking for. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, um, it's one of the things which I enjoy most in films is when you have like, just a couple of sections, just a couple of seconds, which tell you all you need to know about a character or a relationship or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and a lot of the, a lot of the material between um, Ellen and Barry, the ex-wife, that rings very true as well. If you've ever gotten out of a relationship where, you know, there was still an attraction, but you're like, this is not this is just not going to fucking work out. This is not going anywhere good, but you're still attracted to the person. I mean, it's, it all rang true to me. Right. Well, I've, it's established through, I, you know, best, I think through the costume design, just to show that she's a very straight laced person. And you know, the two of them don't, don't mesh. Yeah. Like she could be married to a guy who sells suits, not a guy who picks fights with Nazis on the, on the radio. Right. Picking fights but, with Nazis is pretty fun, though. Let's be real. Right, yeah. I mean, hey, that's why, you know, most of us are on Twitter, because you can yell at these people. And that brings me back to the question I asked before, which, which is like... Yeah, you don't need an what are the Right, like, what are the politics of, of this movie? Because if, as Josh was saying, you know, this was a play about a guy, mm-hmm. and not necessarily a, a critique of, it, of the, the media landscape. And I kind of lean toward what you were saying josh because like i don't know like there's definitely more to this movie than just like oh like you know look at this circus of scumbags like calling into the radio show and being like there's something deeper in there i'm just not sure what it is well so uh we should go we should probably talk about the ending to really get into that because i think that's where the movie adaptation really shows its hand um the play ends with Barry's monologue, uh, you know, the one where he talks about how, you know, all you fucking people, you just want to talk to me all day and, you know, blah, 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 yeah, pearls like, before your, swine. Yeah, and it's like your fear and your anger that keeps you motivated, which exactly. immediately made me think of Twitter. Yes, and I think that <laughs> that, it, that that monologue, by the no. way, <laughs> that monologue, by the wrong. way, <laughs> is um, word for word the same as in the play. Mm-hmm. Um but it ends there. Uh, well, it doesn't quite end there. It actually ends with the part where, you know, he like pushes buttons trying to talk to different people and they're all saying stuff that he hates. And it ends with um, Ralph with his call. Ralph being the guy who's like, hey, I'm at my house. You can come over if you want. We can connect. And then Barry leaves the studio. And then the next thing that we see is the character of Susan sitting down, who's sort of like a Dr. Laura Schlesinger type. And it's implied that it's like the next day, and now she's starting the morning program, you know? Mm-hmm. None of that shit with the Nazis. Like, it, he doesn't go out to the parking lot and get shot. Like, there's no, there, none of that happens. Um, none of that stuff with different people being like, here's what Barry meant to me. None of that stuff is in there. It ends on a much more subdued note, making us think about, like, what does human connection and conversation mean? Now, I think that Oliver Stone wanted to make it about the media. And he wanted to make it about, like, how does listener perception of these personas that, you know, shock jocks or just radio personalities in general create, how does that affect the way that we interact with each other? And that's why I think in the movie, after um, they, you know, shoot and kill Barry, after the Nazi shoots and kills Barry, you have that whole pre-credit sequence where it's just panning across the Dallas skyline and you're hearing people talking about what Barry meant to them. Yeah, I wasn't um I wasn't actually sure how to how to take the fade out to be honest. What did you think about it, Tim? Uh well, so we're talking about, you know, the monologue at the end and you know, what does it all mean, right? Um Well, that and also the, the kind of the aftermath of Barry's death where you get, you know, kind of the vox populi of people offering their cacophony of opinions on the departed Barry. Because, again, he doesn't die in the play. They added an extra 10 minutes onto the movie that isn't in the play at all. 
Um, well, I didn't, uh, I mean, I just, you know, read it as a eulogy. Um, it, I, I think I, I feel differently about the, um, uh, or my takeaway from the, the ending monologue is maybe different from Josh's. Cause I think, um, you know, Josh is saying that it is, you know, it's just a, uh, an abrasive narcissist <laughs> or, or something just like pushing people away. But I, th I think that what, um, you know, what Barry's getting to at the end of it is that, you know, he's, he's a sick person commenting, you know, on a sick society. Like, he, he hates himself, so, you know, hence the antagonistic, you know, relationship with the listeners. But then it's also like, what is, you know, what is the reason that people have for engaging with him in this way? And that it it is, you know, like, uh, like the movie mentioned earlier, you know, it's a lot of this, you know, hate and fear motivating people. And you see the way that the character ends. You see that, you know, he, he there's no, like, ratcheting down in his you know, antagonistic relationship with his, with his audience. So it's only going to get worse, and it's only going to get more intense and more out of control. So if he is, if we experience what happens to him as a result of him having this, um, you know, fearful, aggressive relationship with the rest of the world what does that bode for the everyone else in the audience? And I think that it, I, I took it as a commentary to be like, this is what happened to this one man who felt this way. And if everyone else is engaging with him in this way, what does that say about the rest of us? So how do you think then that the shooting fits into that? The fact that they kill him at the end? I think that that's saying like, this is what happened to him. And if you continue to, like if this is the way that you engage with your media, this is this is going to happen to you too in one way or another i'm i'm saying that it's like it it is a um you know i uh not not my term but you know the words death cult get thrown around a lot and i think that it's like if you have no way of ratcheting back from this uh you know antagonistic relationship with you know other people strangers or people that you know online then it is only going to come to a head and it's kind of like you know if we want to invoke uh, short eyes again um one of the things that happens earlier on in that is you know the guards have a very pragmatic approach to uh you know, interpersonal conflict in the prison system which is just like let them fight like if you don't let them fight if you don't let them settle it you know eventually it's gonna you know keep brewing and then you know someone's gonna get shivved so it's you know let let them fight let them you know vent their frustrations but um if if the uh if, if the engagement that the audience and the host has only exists on this antagonistic level you're just going to get concentrated antagonism and where does that end um I, well we see how it ends for for barry we see how it ends for the host but if other people only choose to engage in the sort of like hateful dialogue w that's going to come back around on them and I, I don't know it feels like i'm i'm you know, paraphrasing like a parable or something, you know, it's like reap what you sow, but it is kind of what it feels like to me. If yeah, you only like, engage with this kind of media in this way. Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to say. And maybe I would need to watch the movie again. Um, I, like I said, I do want to read the play um, and maybe reading it would throw the film into, into sharper relief mm -hmm. because I, do think that the um the kind of the emphasis on nazis and hate speech um that does appear to have come from oliver stone's version of you know what he wanted the movie to be um i also i watched some of uh, uh natural born killers like after i finished the movie because you know it had been a while and i was like well you know this was also a critique of the media was it not right um, that's a great soundtrack too i wish uh, trent reznor did more soundtracks <laughs> <laughs> it is a banging soundtrack. Yeah. Um, but, and I think Natural Born, I mean, people are really, really, really divided on Natural Born Killers. I think it works extremely well as like kind of like a, a jaundiced nightmare version of American media. I think as I put it on Letterboxd, um, you know, watching it kind of makes you feel sick, like mm -hmm. America. Um, <laughs> but... You know, and that's certainly very, that's a very pointed, like, javelin, like, really, like, aimed at the heart of the United States, which, uh, I don't know, it's like our culture just, like, kind of 
floats on this like superstructure of like the media like everything about us is like so defined by it it defines our opinions and like our political beliefs and yeah um so i don't know if maybe uh talk radio was um you know an earlier version of that where he took the opportunity to use um barry champlain's story this um this concentrated portrait of a type of guy to kind of broaden his aim a little bit. Yeah. Well, something that was interesting because, you know, Tim, you had pointed that like, you know, to paraphrase what you were saying that Mm -hmm. the, the critique here is essentially like, if you listen to too much of this kind of thing, if you engage with this kind of thing too much, you know, it's like, it's gazing into the abyss, right? Like we too, uh, like it'll gaze back into us and then we too become the monsters or whatever. Yeah. Um, but you know, it, it, and I think that's, I think that is a fair, um, interpretation of, 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 of what this is. I think you're pretty much mm-hmm. bang on the money. I think maybe why then this movie falls short for me is that I don't feel like that rises to the level of any sort of a meaningful structural critique, really. Okay. Like it, it doesn't, because it doesn't really say anything about material conditions at all. Right. Like, because if you wanted to make this about and again, this is like just talking about if this were a completely different movie from what it is, um, if you wanted to do a play or a movie really about, um, you know, the format of talk radio and what it does to people, you would need to also look at the conditions in which people are listening to it. You know, the fact that, like, talk yeah. radio as a genre predominantly appeals to, like, hardcore conservatives and has had a major impact in shaping public opinion. You know, between, like, Rush Limbaugh, um, Sean Hannity, and, and all that other fucking stuff, and the fact that, if you want to talk about, like, where it's at now, that that whole sort of way of uh, establishing your relationships with one's audience has carried through into the podcast age with, like, Joe Rogan and Ben Shapiro... Um, that is, that is something that is completely missing from this. And and you can't really talk about the format without talking about that. It's sort of hard though to, to, to draw a line. I don't want to say draw a line directly because obviously, um, podcasting is kind of the bastard child of, of radio. Um, but it's so hard to compare the two or even to compare the media landscape of 1988 to the media landscape of... 2022 because yeah. like right now like everything is so fragmented and um like i don't know how many people would be watching tucker carlson in the 1980s like with fewer channels um fewer other avenues of media to draw people's attentions i think right now what does he get like you know three million viewers mm-hmm. or whatever which is a drop in the bucket to a a, a, a country of you know 360 million people or whatever um and to go back to howard stern like nobody is going to break as big as howard stern ever again certainly not in that medium because uh, you know even joe rogan like you know it's dependent on like people who are on spotify and who listen to podcasts and and you know want to hear him talk about you know like supplements or being an alpha MMA fighter or whatever the fuck he talks about. Um, Didn't even tell you. Everything has become so um, compartmentalized in terms of you can choose like any kind of any form of entertainment that you want. You yeah, aren't you necessarily reality. Yeah, you're not stuck listening to the radio. Like right. so um, the experience of most people with shock jocks is I, I feel that um, you know, because radio was a pervasive present, it was something that you put on at work to kill time or whatever. You listen to it in the car on your shitty commute, you know, just to pass the time. Um, there was, you were more forced to interact with these with these figures. Like, you can see why Barry Champlain would have been, uh, well, I mean, you see why he's going national. Um, he's getting a yeah. little too big for Texas, um, yeah, he's, he's very th- engaging, and he, he gets people mad and calling in, just like, you know, Facebook and their algorithm. Well, in, in something that I wanted to... Oh, my God, did Barry Champlain facilitate a genocide in Myanmar? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. If he'd gone Damn. national, he could have. 
You um, very well could have. I'm s- what one one <laughs> one thought that I had with regard to that whole point though about like what was possible with radio at that point, you know, versus what is possible now. Because mm-hmm. I realized I was kind of like, what if we just took this movie and like made it now instead? And that's not a fair critique, right? We have to analyze it in the context of when it was produced. Um, but Rush Limbaugh was a thing at that point, and yes. you know he was really in his ascendancy at that point. And I would mm-hmm. argue that Rush Limbaugh is a shock. It was a shock. Thank God he's dead. But like, right. I think that took too goddamn long, if you ask me. Absolutely. But you know, one of the things that helped him become such a powerful figure and such a widely listened to figure was that he took the shock jock format and applied mm-hmm. it to an explicitly political project. And again, I, I think that this movie touches on that a little bit, but the way that it touches on it is it has the callers saying this stuff rather than the host. And, and Barry being sort of like a, I, I don't know if you want to call him a liberal, but like certainly somebody who is not a dyed-in-the-wool conservative at least, his, intensi- his, uh, his instinctual reaction is to push back on that mm-hmm. as opposed to somebody like Rush who propagandized on the behalf of it and so i guess i just don't a a more interesting version of this maybe would be also again if you want to make it a political critique would have the character of barry being a more explicitly political person in some way rather than just a contrarian is that just like stephen colbert then well, it would be like, um, I mean, if, if, if Barry Champlain is a liberal, he's kind of like a Bill Maher liberal. Right, right. Um, like, he tends, he can sometimes let his anger get away with him, and he also has some real shitty opinions. Although early in the movie, you see him arguing in favor of needle exchange mm-hmm. to, uh, to stop the spread of AIDS. Yeah, again, very um, pragmatic. And, yeah, and most of his callers are pretty reactionary. But um, the thing to keep in mind is, um, and, you know, I, I can't say if this entered the mind of Oliver Stone or, or Boghossian when they were writing it. Um, certainly, like, if you're on the left, um, you feel very alienated from mainstream media opinion because there really isn't, like, much of a channel for the left and like i'm not talking about what are you talking about we got podcasts (laughs) (laughs) we got the liberal run media and we got got my uh, podcast yeah like the 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 expansive way in which um you know they talk on fox news about the left which is just like you know anybody who doesn't believe that the homeless should be turned into chum and fed to sharks like Mm -hmm. oh that's liberal you know everything liberal leftist doesn't matter same communist anarchist socialist yeah same it's it's the same fucking thing the left um but as we know and i'm sure our listeners know um if you look at the media you know okay you could tune into like cnn or msnbc or uh the daily show or john oliver or whatever and it's like okay like this is liberal but left like just by nature of those sh- those shows or those channels like they're they're not going to say anything particularly fucking radical um and i wonder if i mean like if if Barry Champlain were like we're talking like he was on like KPFK or something like um or i mean if he legitimately had like you know say he went on and started talking about like the proletariat or like you know had like these overt communist oh. signifiers because he's being called a communist anyway right like people right. call in and be like you f- you yeah, may, as well, may as well fag, own blah, it blah, blah. yeah um and i wonder if maybe um like that's just impossible to visualize in america because who is spouting communist socialist ideas like on the air like certainly not now and definitely not in 1988. Yeah, no, like, I mean it's well, well, Brett and Brian are. <laughs> <laughs> yes, our friends at Street Fight. Um, but you know, I think too that a lot of this assumes a certain familiarity with those structural forces, and it's I, again, I don't know Eric Bogosian personally. I haven't talked to him about politics. I have to imagine though that if I did. If I sat down with him and like got to talking for a bit, 
his own personal politics are probably pretty standard issue liberal as well. And he probably, again, this is an assumption, but he probably, based on the work of his that I've seen, assumes a certain like standard issue we live in a society, man, and we all got to take care of each other is sort of being the <laughs> fundamentals of an ideal political system. Yeah, right? and it's it's interesting, especially in light of Oliver Stone being one of the few leftist media figures that we have, um, certainly working at that level. Um, I mean, like in Hollywood, they'll tolerate radical politics to a degree, but you know, the minute you start putting it in your movies, it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, how are you going to Yeah, how's this going to play in China? Or, right, or Peoria or, or right. wherever. Um, and I do think it's interesting that um, the movie, and Josh, maybe you can tell me if this is true of the play. Um, Alan Berg uh, broadcasted from Denver, Colorado, and that's where he was killed. In the movie, it's Texas. Uh, the play is uh, actually set in Cleveland. I'll be damned. Oh, even worse. Yeah. <laughs> it makes me wonder because, like, um, you know, to go back to Natural Born Killers, like, um, that takes place in the Southwest. Um, that was a... I know that Taran Quentin Tarantino came up with the story, but he, I believe he later disowned the screenplay. Um, so I'm going to ascribe it to Stone. It's um, not the kindest view of the American Southwest and being from there, um, you know, I can kind of see where it comes from. I mean, I've been to Kingman, Arizona, um, <laughs> but it <Why>? may, <laughs> we were, we were driving through on the 40. Um, okay. it, it may be a, a little bit of an unkind portrait of, well, what we would call now red States. Um, so, you know, I wonder if this is just Oliver Stone kind of um, giving a very jaundiced perspective. He just has a bone to pick. Right. Um, yeah, well, and then at the end, like, uh, when when Barry is murdered, um, and interestingly, um, the person playing his killer is uh, Rockets Red Glare, the comedian and, I believe, uh, drug dealer, um, who some people have blamed for the death of Nancy Spungen. Um, but I don't know if that's actually true. Um, it's not, it's, I mean, it's, it's kind of the, um, it's like, I don't want to say a caricature of a white supremacist, but you know, it's, uh, what you would kind of think of is like a, you know, a portrayal of like, just like a truly disgusting, like awful person. And I mean, is that like Oliver Stone looking at Texas? Well, I think part of it is that Oliver Stone is, you know, from New York. And I will say that, like, you know, a lot of my, I've lived here, obviously. I've been here for a long time. A lot of my friends are from here. Um, but there's, Some of my best friends are New Yorkers. Some of my best friends are New Yorkers. <laughs> uh, exactly. But there's a certain type of New Yorker who is, like, from Manhattan. You know, Oliver Stone went to Trinity. Like, he's a fucking, you know, he, he grew up in that part of the city and i think that when you are of that class in that part of the city there's always going to be like the heartland or whatever is always mm -hmm. going to feel alien to you in a way that it won't if you are from either the outer boroughs of you know or, or like you know the actual like real part of a city <laughs> sorry manhattanites if you're listening to this but go fuck yourself um, Take that, Will Miniker. That's right, Will. Um, <laughs> <laughs> You're disinvited to my brownstone. <laughs> but, um, like, it is this thing that I've noticed with some people who just can't really fathom the idea of, like, being from a part of the country that is out there and having a distinct identity that isn't just sort of the American monoculture, even though the American monoculture, as we all know, is eating more and more and more of the parts of the country that actually are distinctive. Yeah, that's true because I believe in, well, in the America of 1988, like these, a lot of these subcultures were obscured by the monoculture. The, the, you know, for example, like the radio network, like giving Barry a platform um, 
you know, those were the voices that you were going to hear. And that was that like people, there were people who just plain did not have access to that venue and couldn't get to it. And it's changed in that, you know, you can, you can go on Twitter and see, you know, the full spectrum of opinions, let's say, um, we have like both the, bad and wrong. Yeah, like the um, the stranglehold on viewpoint has been loosened somewhat, but in terms of like the mainstream, the lamestream media. Um, oh, that's good. It's... That's great. <laughs> yeah. Did you come up with it's... that? It sounds <laughs> yes, like I did mainstream. just now. That's funny. I've copyrighted it. <laughs> um, it, it. There's still like a stranglehold on these venues of like public opinion um i don't know where i was going with that well i mean it's just a different way of sort of (laughs) massaging and shaping opinion and attitudes like you do still have you know subcultures and you know pockets of you know people who have a different experience and feel a different way um and i think what you're saying jen is that you would have otherwise only been exposed to it um through talk radio through these gatekeepers whereas now you can just you know kind of go directly to the source and you know mm-hmm. find someone who posts uh, just a, a weird opinion on twitter and then you can all uh, dogpile them yeah and it's interesting like watching this movie and you know thinking like oh well you know the the nazis and chuds calling into barry's show mm-hmm. um you know yeah they had a megaphone for one night a week or whatever but Right. Nowadays, like, you can Well, find, first of all, like, nowadays they have Tucker Carlson, so, like... Yeah. yeah that, they, they aren't exactly that. arguing with him. But, you know, it's kind of like the difference between, like, um, you know, Trump conservatives and, like, National Review conservatives, mm. where it's like, you know, um, uh, the, the vulgar Trumpism versus the more... Um, intellectual oh i don't know if we should do that like national review conservatism um and maybe it's because like you know kind of the the loosening of these controls that you know something like um you know trump and maga was able to get loose in a way because the thing is is that you know um like i was saying like you know the chuds calling into barry like they didn't really have a platform beyond like their five minutes before Barry hangs up on them. Um, I mean, yes, like there was and still is, you know, like a network of like white supremacists, like, uh, you know, exchanging their ideas and, you know, saying like, hey, read the Turner Diaries. It's great. And yeah, like that I thought shit. that was so interesting that they actually name check Turner Diaries specifically. Yeah, you guys should check it out. It's really good. Um, uh, thanks, Oliver. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's not in the movie, you know, by the way. Or uh, that's not in the play, by the way. Uh, that right. Turner Diaries thing is specifically in the movie. Yeah, I so I will 100% like put that at the feet at at Oliver Stone. Like, yeah, you know, like um, you know, you could publish a white supremacist hateful book, but you know, how many copies are you going to print? How many copies are you going to sell? Like, you're yeah, somewhat how do you limited get in your with reach. Yeah, self-published book. It's it's hard for any uh any small author. Right, but then like Ireland, um, racist or not. But I, I don't know. Like, yeah, one other thing though that I would also argue and I think, I think, you know, I don't think we're in disagreement about this, but, like, I think that the reactionary project has succeeded in hijacking most of the conversation mm-hmm. now. Like, it, because it's not just that those small audiences have been able to connect more on Twitter or whatever. It's also mm-hmm. that they have a much larger share of the national megaphone. Right. And I think that goes to what you're talking about, like, um, actual, like, material and structural issues Mm -hmm. because like so many of the people with most of the money are just inherently reactionary like whether they're you know whether you're an elon musk or like a you know somebody who's trying to appear like a humanitarian like bill gates you know you're still going to have these shared class interests you're still going to have like the bulk of the capital and you're like they're going to be the people making things happen and spreading these ideas, you know, like conspiracy theories about George Soros aside. Um, I haven't seen one check from that guy, by the way. I have. Right. Yeah. I get them every week. Oh, oh I knew it. Well, it's because you're in New York. Yeah. 
Um, um, <laughs> yeah, see, this is why we had to raise if, our prices from $2 to 5 oh, okay? Yeah. So if you're mad, take it up with Soros. Don't take it up with me. That's but the how other thing, they afford those high New York rents. Yeah, that's that's how we're 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 rolling in the money with our Patreon. Um, <laughs> it's actually George Soros matches our Patreon dollar for dollar. Um, but the um, the other thing to the point of material conditions also is industry consolidation, right? Like the fact that yes. you know the that's a good point. The, yeah, how are you going to get a leftist? Uh, you know, media company when it's all corporate conglomerates. Exactly. Yeah. And when, and when Are companies... Are you going to get a clear channel? Clear like, channel no. or the, their lesser known <laughs> weird ass evangelical counterpart, Salem Media, which owns hundreds upon hundreds of stations nationally and has them all dialed into like one fucking message. You know, what has I saw happened... That super cut, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or no, that was, that was, um, uh, that was, a, that was Sinclair. That was oh Sinclair my. Media. I'm talking about Salem Media. This is one that you guys should look into. Um, it is uh, an evangelical Christian radio network with hundreds of stations nationwide that plays Christian music and sermons mostly, but also, um, of course, they have like news bulletins and they tell you exactly how to think. Whereas because of industry consolidation on the left, we have some podcasts and even like the most <laughs> influential of them are dwarfed by something like, again, the Ben Shapiro show, or to use the big daddy of them all, Joe Rogan, who like, I think his audience is like twice what the second largest podcast even is. Like we're playing with pennies and the rest of the, and, and they're playing with, you know, hundred dollar bills. It's just not even close. Yeah. Like, um, for a long time, Chapa was, I think like the top earner on Patreon. But when I checked the other day, I saw how much money Tim Dillon is making, and uh, I had to go lie down for a little while. Yeah, and, and even Tim Dillon is, again, fucking bupkis compared to some of these bigger shows that are on, like, the national networks and stuff like that, the big podcast networks. So these are the material yeah. conditions that you're talking about, where there's just that much like, order of magnitudes, you know, more money going through to, to prop up these viewpoints. Yeah, and, and I think in the world of podcasting, too, what you're going to end up seeing is the big companies are going to buy up all of the podcast networks because that's just the nature of the thing, and we don't have a functional antitrust uh, law in this country anymore. I mean, now we're, like, yeah. way off track of talking about, like, talk radio, the movie, but I think that if the movie pointed to any of these material conditions, which were already in place at that time, like this stuff was starting to happen due to, you know, Reagan rolling back a whole lot of regulations and stuff like that, mm -hmm. that could maybe point to something bigger and more structural that would be more interesting than what I think Oliver Stone ended up pointing to in this movie. Yeah, I guess when you... Well, there um, you have it. <laughs> yeah, when you graph the media critique onto the... Um, kind of character study mm -hmm. that seems to be what Talk Radio the Play was. I can see how maybe it would uh, seem a little bit uh, Frankenstein, if you will. Yeah, I'd say at, le at least a little bit. Okay, so I think that maybe the movie is engaging more with like the content rather than the, the structures behind what creates this content. I still found it um, an enjoyable watch. Um, maybe... Again, like not having uh, read the play, not having like something to compare it to. So, you know, I was just kind of coming to this fresh. Um, I didn't enjoy the directing and there are a hell of a lot of really good performances. How did you this. feel about that hippie guy's performance? Because that drove me up a fucking wall. That That's actually. Michael Wincott. Um, no shade to Michael Wincott, but that did ring like uh, kind of a cartoonish note. Like as a kind of like. Uh, demonic um, amalgam of every like burnout and idiot like listening to Barry's show. Um, it is kind of funny again, the two of them just like Barry's just like seething contempt for the guy where it's like you're my fucking listener. Why am I doing this <laughs> show? Yeah and you know maybe that's uh, um, maybe that's what um, Stone was getting at yeah, where it's like don't meet your heroes don't meet your audience. Yeah, like him, um, oh shit, like I need to stop returning DMs. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, if this, if uh, Kent, I believe was the character's name, is like just kind of like a representation of the audience, like just the audience like melted down into one dipshit. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, like, I did find that that performance was, like, over the top. Like, oh, so this is what you think, like, metalheads are like? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Like, uh, uh, Tim, have you ever met a guy like that? Uh, in high school, I mean, that would be the closest, <laughs> but I don't tend to associate with people like that, so... Never played D&D with Kent? I played D&D with Ken, and that was plenty. <laughs> Ken sucks, by the way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean... Um, Fuck him. Ken. Yeah, right? Yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah. You know what's up. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the, um... You know, as this this portrait of a listener, like, you know, I think Josh is right to bring it up. Um, and maybe that anticipates uh, natural born killers and its uh, cartoonish characters. Like, natural born killers is what, like 94? This was 1988. So we weren't far off from that. Uh, hey, uh, Alec Baldwin, he's also in this. He is. Um,. I was I, for, I always forget how hot he was. You know, it's interesting. I feel like early on he looked so much like John Travolta. Oh, an elongated John Travolta. Yeah, perhaps. you take you take John Travolta and you just stretch him out a little bit. <laughs> yeah, and keep the hair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like this was um geez, this was like matinee idol Alec Baldwin and man, is, it's is really this- something to Hmm? Is this pre or post Glenn Gary Glenn Ross? I, I should be able to look that up on my own. Yeah, I'll look that it was. Up too. Oh, it's it's pre. Glenn oh. Gary was ninety two. Ah, wow. Yes, and just on the on the threshold of a uh, hunt for Red October, I believe. Right. Yeah. Um. Yeah, it's weird to look back at like that Alec Baldwin and see like an actor with like looks and talent to burn because like he wasn't just like a a handsome guy he could really fucking act and you know not to mention a show that you guys neither of you guys have watched again uh 30 rock but you know it's an older alec baldwin but he's like he is so funny on that show and he's a complete lunatic in real life but again like talent to burn he may or may not have murdered somebody so like yeah i mean he did but like there's a question of to what extent it was his fault Yeah, like, was it his fault? Was it the, um, you know, the the person the like, wrangling? Yeah, wrangling the the guns on the set, etc. Yeah. Um. Geez. Yeah, but there's that 1980s Alec Baldwin, Frozen in Time. I also recommend Beetlejuice. <laughs> right. So <laughs> yeah. my my he's thoughts also, on. Oh no! Go ahead. Uh, I was gonna say he's also kind of a sympathetic character in that he's you know trying to pull Barry back from the void, where it's like. Hey, buddy, this is just a job. Like, you don't need to... I mean, like, as, like, corporate a-holes go, you know what I mean? Right, yeah. He's like, because like... you have the you have the John Pankow character. Shouts out John Pankow from um, To Live and Die in L.A., one of my favorite movies of all time. Um, he's, like, you know, like, Alec Baldwin is a suit, you know, running the radio station. But then you have this other suit from, like, the mega corporation, which is going to take Barry national. And, mm. you know, he wants the, he wants him to clean up his act. Um, and the Alec Baldwin character is kind of like caught between the two. Yeah, it's like, and, yeah, just dial it back. Don't, you know, burn out. Just keep it at a low simmer. Yeah, Continue and Continue to that, line my pockets. Yeah, because, like, he does have that sliver of a conscience, it seems. Mm-hmm. And, like, he does appear to care about Yeah, and I think only as a Barry. foil to Barry, yeah. So, right. m- my thoughts on Alec Baldwin were that I think he turned in a fine performance, but I actually thought he was miscast. Um, I think that that particular character needs to actually be a bit older in order for it to make sense. Like, it needs to be a guy who could potentially be old enough to have sort of seen the lay of the land and know the ropes. (laughs) And I think he also needs to be a little bit more waspy, like kind of, you know, well, that's not how we do it in this business, like that kind of thing. Um, so that he can serve then as an effective uh, foil to uh, Barry, who is so fucking, you know, he's just raw id all the time. And uh, can then sort of serve as a, a better moderating force to his excesses. And it, it just, it was one of those things where it was a fine performance that felt like it was not the right person for the role, to me. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, maybe the foil was more the, or, 
you know, in a way we have, uh, I don't, I don't know, like there's, um, it's hard to say if there's like one person kind of like in opposition to, to Barry, because like, even in terms of his, you know, personal life, he's, he's juggling two women. I think the John C. McGinley character is probably the closest in Maybe, the sense but, that he throws I mean, in curveballs all the time. Sure. He does seem like he parties pretty hard, though. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, hey, it's that guy from Scrubs. I never cared he's, for Scrubs. He's an enabler. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a good way of putting it. Like, there's like um, a slight antagonism between the two because, you know, Barry will be very upset about, like, the calls that, uh, that you know, he's sending him, but... Hey, you know, they still party together. Right. Like, it's it's interesting because there are, like, all these people kind of, like, trying to pull Barry back from the brink, but also, like, pushing him slightly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, pushing him up to a point to, like, you know, do your best, but don't wreck yourself doing it. Right. Yeah. Like, um, like, they're all with Barry, like, right up to the edge of the cliff. And then he's the one who falls off, basically. Right. So, um, you know who played Barry in the 2007 Broadway revival? You didn't get the part? Who? Lev Schreiber. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Again, I think that is probably, it makes sense. Like, again, Lev Schreiber can really lean into that really raw id, but you, you, need, a, you need a strong countervailing force, even if it's a countervailing force that will not be able to fully stand up against him in order to make that balance. And maybe it's just because Alec Baldwin in his career has made such a, a, a career of playing big blustery guys. I'm not really sure to what extent it's like what he did later versus what he did in that movie. But Well, I feel like there were phases of Baldwin's career because, you know, like 1988, we're still talking about like hot, leading man Baldwin, Mm -hmm. but still doing like these interesting supporting parts. Um, And then as he, as he aged and, you know, I feel like his, I don't know. It's like his, his career has been reasonably steady, but you know, periodically he'll take these hits in like, in terms of public image, because like, like I said, he's a a psycho. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And his his daughter's a fat pig too. (laughs) (laughs) Um, like when he did, when he started doing 30 Rock, it's like, okay, this is like an, you know, the next phase of Alec Baldwin, like he's pivoting to comedy and like doing it quite ably because, you know, he was playing that like older, like establishment type that Josh was talking about where, you know, this is very like old, old money, like corporate, like connected, like just totally different feel from like the young sharp Mm -hmm. Baldwin Um, I don't know where I'm going with that hey Alec Baldwin he's in this yeah (laughs) there you have it the guy from 30 Rock back when he was on talk radio but I'm not like he has um, so much hair (laughs) do you want to speculate in like the you know talk radio uh, universe that is the same character who then you know went on to the um uh, jeez. To be Jack to in be 30 Rock? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, to be the head go. of GE. Yeah, why not? <laughs> why not? <laughs> Whatever. I like yeah. that. Sure, there you go. That's his name, yeah. right? Jack? Yes, Jack Donaghy, I think. Yeah, um, I don't, well, hey, like, we've, uh, we've brought full circle. We've turned it, uh, we've turned the Oliver Stone universe into a, uh, a metaverse, if you will. It's <laughs> Hell yes. Connected. Um, maybe Mickey and Mallory were calling in to Barry's show. Yeah, I'm sure it's, you know, probably, you know, uh, Mallory's uh, father, Roddy Dangerfield, who's one, is a regular listener. To talk. I, she was, I mean, she was probably calling in saying that her, her daddy was touching her. Yeah. And uh, Barry would make hay out of that and then move to the next caller. And hang up on her, yeah. Well, um, I think I brought us into, like, a dead end, but, uh, Josh, have we touched on all the points that you wanted to make about about talk radio? Yeah, like, pretty in much. In particular, the um, kind of the awkward transition from play to movie. Yeah, and, and maybe, again, maybe if my first exposure hadn't been the play, I would have liked the movie more. Um, but I'm also like a fucking theater asshole, and so it's very <laughs> rare that I'll see a movie adaptation of a play where I'll be like, yes, 
Nailed it. Um, Have I've, you seen? Yes. Except for Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross fucking rules. That's a great so, f- film adaptation that's even better than the play. And I have, have seen s- three versions of Miss Julie that come nowhere near the first uh, time that I saw it uh, performed on stage. Yeah, of course. Tim, so. you really need to watch the Swedish version that was made in the 1950s that's on Criterion. I did watch it. You did? Yeah. But, I mean, it's oh. still the same story. You, you know, you never forget your first time. It's a great I adaptation. I don't know. I really... I really liked it. Um, I'm not saying it was but, bad. I'm just saying it doesn't come close to the stage. I don't know. Maybe I'm just biased, but I, I'm could be. I know what Josh, you know, means. Josh, have you seen uh, the Lion in Winter with Peter O'Toole and Catherine Hepburn? Uh, I have not because I am not like I'm. I'm. I'm a cultural. I'm cultural swine. I'm. I'm. I'm illiterate when it comes to movies. I mean, Which is so why we am I, had you on our but. Show. <laughs> I mean, like I said, like, I'm not exactly a theater maven, but um, I do enjoy Lion in Winter. So, hey, you know, check it out. It's quite good, in my opinion. And I do like the play. I've actually read the play, although it was a long time ago. Um, Tim, is there any th- was there any final point that you wanted to make about uh, talk radio? I, my uh, takeaway from it was that the, you know, host exists as an allegory. Like, what is the end for... You know, a world that hates itself and pushes away all opportunities to get better. Like, who, how does that society end? That was my takeaway from it. Well, we're living it, brother. I was going to yeah. say, <laughs> a society, we live in one of those. Right. <laughs> Uh-oh. I don't recommend it. No, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't like living in a society. No. <laughs> what else? Are there any, like, uh, dog ends that we want to pick up on talk radio? Dog ends? Let me, let me look over my notes here. Just like the, um, you know, kind of like the stubbed out end of the cigarette, I guess. Oh, sure. Right. Lingering little things. Right. Yeah. I like the specificity of having a scene at SMU that very quickly communicated what world this guy travels in. I like that a lot. Um, like Explain. They, well, so SMU is, uh, you know, a, a university that is one of the wealthiest institutions in Dallas that is very well connected to like oil money. It's also a traditionally Christian school. Um, and it has a tradition of, uh, shall we say, pay to play in the college athletics world. Um, their football team mm. actually was banned from competing for an entire year because their boosters were um, paying you know, college athletes. So the fact that they brought Barry in to be like the guy who was talking about who who was there uh, to stand there while they talked about how great the basketball team was going to be that year um, just showed you what world in Dallas he was connected to. And I actually really liked the way that in general Dallas was like I said, this was originally set in Cleveland and didn't do a whole lot of specific stuff with the fact that it was in Cleveland. Whereas I felt right. the movie adaptation really made good use of using Dallas as an additional character. Wow. That adds like a lot of extra context to that scene where he goes to the basketball game. Yeah. It, 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 for it, me. It's, it's so much more the fact that it wasn't just a basketball game, but it was an SMU basketball game. Yeah. Cause I know fuck all about college athletics. I'm learning a lot tonight. And also SMU is not good, right? Like, to, the, <laughs> the, because they, they, unless they pay, unless they are able to pay enough to get good players, because they're not at the right. level of something like, you know, fucking Texas A&M or UT Austin right. or something like that, because they are a smaller Christian unit, well, Christian, uh, quote unquote, <laughs> yeah, as traditionally the institution, Christian. not the belief system. Yeah, exactly. I mean, <laughs> yes, actually. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Tim, do you have anything else on talk radio? Uh, I, I did want to, um, uh, comment on, uh, his, his story about, you know, when he went to the, uh, concentration camp and, you know, he found the, the little star of David. And it's interesting that, you know, he's telling that, that whole story when it's all made up <laughs> his story, not the Holocaust. <laughs> nice save. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's all I wanted to say. <laughs> uh, that's what happens when you co-host a show with a guy named Heidrich. Hey, we were in Argentina at the time. <laughs> um, before we finish up, um, if you're listening to this, it's on the free feed. Um, 
We just want to mention that uh, we are losing our $2 tier for, for bonus episodes. Um, it will be relegated to a support tier, uh, the SMU of tiers. Um, mm-hmm. We're moving to a Texas A&M style tier at $5. $5 gets you access to all of our bonus episodes. We're, we've uh, racked up more than 50 at this point, so there's a lot of extra stuff yeah, that and- you could hear. Just over half of them are pretty good. So, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Tim. Thank you for helping me sell the show. That's a great. I, um, I, I tell no lies. <laughs> um, Josh, is there anything you would like to plug? Perhaps your very good podcast. Oh well, what a nice natural lead-in. Um, <laughs> no, um, so I uh, co-host a show called The Worst of All Possible Worlds. Uh, it is a podcast where every week we do case studies in the pop culture of a dying empire. So whether we're talking about movies, radio shows, theater, uh, we actually uh, did a recent episode about The Visit, which is a Swiss play that really says has a lot to say about society. Um, you know, if, if that's the sort of thing that sounds like it's up your alley, uh, check us out. We are also on Patreon, patreon.com slash worst of all. Or you can check out our website, which is worstpossible.world. And we're going to have a very special guest on the podcast soon. Oh man, some idiot! I bet. No, no, it's a very this 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 very erudite uh, thinker uh, who you know co-hosts a podcast about movies. Actually, oh wow, I hadn't heard of such a thing. Yeah, Is there, huh, how many movie podcasts could there be? <laughs> Sounds like they're scraping the bottom of the barrel, if you ask me. <laughs> uh. But yeah, uh, Jen, we're really excited, obviously, to have you on. Um, and that episode, actually, when, when is this episode releasing? The one we're recording right now. Uh, this one is going to drop on, uh, the intention is to drop it on the 29th. Wonderful. So uh, this coming week, then, uh, we will be releasing our episode with Jen. Um, and Woo! we're going to be talking about a really fucking wild, wild thing called Adventures in Odyssey, which is a christian radio drama for children um we're going to in the great tradition of what we do on the show we like to force our guests to listen to episodes of this fucking thing and talk about it so we're gonna have a great time check it out yeah and this is a thing which i only really know by name and from some excerpts that i've heard on your show yes (laughs) so uh this is this is going to be very interesting this is going to be me like wandering in a a world I never made. I'm not particularly cognizant of um, kind of the evangelical milieu. It's very superficial on my part. So uh, it'll be it'll be interesting to see me breaking my brain on this stuff. Yeah, so, we're gonna uh, we're gonna do we're gonna do the like clockwork orange thing with you, except yeah. rather than your <laughs> eyes, it's gonna be your ears because it's a radio. The, oh. You're going to um, super glue my AirPods into my ears. That's and right. Play episodes of uh, Adventures of Odyssey. <laughs> That's exactly it. right. It's a sin. Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, Josh, thank you very much for your time and the recommendation. You brought all kinds of wonderful context to this movie from uh, the world of theater because um, we are, we too, we are not cultured. We are dumb. Oh, I'm dumb too. It's just that my my the thing that makes me dumb is that I only see plays and not movies. So I'm culturally culturally illiterate the other way around. This has been you know three what, dumb next... people talking. <laughs> That's, That's so right, every, Tim. <laughs> so every single podcast ever. Yeah. Yeah, like the gatekeepers have been murdered, folks. Like just this car- is what you get. Yeah, caricatures of us laughing over a studio mic. Well, I don't know. That Joe Rogan guy's pretty smart. He has like <laughs> Two million followers, Jen. Yeah, man. Someday, baby. More followers I don't equals know. better than. What kind of supplement should we start selling? Something that makes your head swell up. <laughs> <laughs> Too late. I can already feel it swelling with the, the coming of the $5 tier. <laughs> yeah, well, swelling with knowledge from <laughs> engaging with uh, your peers in the media criticism circle. <sighs> I like I like that uh, sales pitch.
Um, I think we can stop our recorders. We have yeah, enough, I don't want to uh, record anything else.